Welcome to Maxwell Institute Conversations, special videocast episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast, hosted by Terrell Givens and created in collaboration with Faith Matters Foundation. You can watch this episode in your podcast app, or if you're on the run, listen to the audio version. Samuel Brown deals in matters of life and death every day. He's a doctor working in a shock trauma ICU. In his spare time, he's also a historian and theologian of Latter-day Saint thought. Brown joins Terrell Givens in this episode of Maxwell Institute Conversations to talk about the ways of discipleship. That if what we're after is being vessels of God's grace and of both experiencing and crafting and responding to who and being shaped by beautiful things is not some capital romantic cop-out. It's the work of salvation. Right. And it will have this incredible harmony of different kinds of things. These special video episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast are sponsored by the Faith Matters Foundation in cooperation with the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Terrell Givens, a videocast sponsored by the Faith Matters Foundation. And our guest today is Sam Brown, an epidemiologist, a historian, uh, a writer, author, and what else would go in your obituary, Sam? Oh, obituaries scare me. Uh, (laughs) the, The one thing I hate about funerals, other than the sadness at the passage, is the sense of utter inadequacy I feel compared to the eulogies of these fine people. So uh, the the obit and the eulogy just makes me feel <laughs> well, like a total schlub. <laughs> well, give us, give us three things that you expect would appear in your obituary. So what I want in my obituary more no, than is, anything? this is what probably would appear, but go ahead. Well, what I want the most in my obituary is that he died defending his family from a grizzly bear attack <laughs> with his bare hands. That's what I want. Okay. That's what I want for my obituary. L- lacking that nice touch. Uh, what I, got else? No, what? I got no idea. Well, what, I mean, what, uh, pictures, pro- pictures, of, pictures of the people I love and who love me I but, would but, want in my obituary. But professionally, what would you be remembered for? Oh, professionally? Um. I run a center called the Center for Humanizing Critical Care at Intermountain Medical Center that is trying to reboot the way we as clinicians accompany people through the frightening experience of a life-threatening illness. And we're working hard to fix what seems to me to be a deeply wounded system that dehumanizes all of the participants, clinicians and patients and families. And I've been working hard at it, but culture change is tricky. And sometimes you you feel like you are a crazy prophet eating grasshoppers and ignored by the bustle of the main system. But professionally, I think um, I would like to be known as a, a figure who forced us to reconsider how we deliver intensive care during a life-threatening illness. Now, you wrote a book some years ago, In Heaven As It Is On Earth. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the title is, uh, it's on the Mormon culture of death. <laughs> Joseph Smith was in it, something about conquest. <laughs> so so to what extent did your interest in death and dying um, inform that book as influenced by your professional work, or was it vice versa? Uh, the, that book started for two interesting reasons that moved in parallel. One was I'd finally become a doctor. I was finally actually treating patients and making decisions. I wasn't just a med student. And I was seeing some death and feeling like I was involved in that process in a very emotionally fraught and morally fraught way, wanting to make sure that I always did precisely the right thing medically and then feeling always a touch of sadness, not just Sadness like John Donne talks about in that beautiful poem, but sadness that maybe I was somehow complicit through my failings as a person. That's why I think people don't realize about doctors and the notion of malpractice, that that doctors are in general relentless self-critics. 
and are always worrying and wondering that they've done something wrong. So I was having that initiation, that experience of feeling like people's physical lives were resting in my hands at the same time that I was talking to my wife, who's the actual scholar in the family, in the human humanities. And someone we hope to have oh, yeah. on our podcast. Yeah, yeah. she's road. great. She's great. Kate Holbrook. So I was talking to her and I'd become, I think all good hearted young people interested in religion have a moment of being sort of in love with Mircea Eliade and his evocation of this religious human being and of the sense of the relationship that we share to a time of origins. So I'd been reading a ton of Merce Eliade. I'd been thinking a lot about time of origins and how it played in Mormonism and realized my very first paper in Mormon studies was this semi-quantitative comparison of rhetorical changes in temple dedication prayers. And I, this was back when I was doing bioinformatics and writing computer code. And I wrote code that would analyze the different prayers that I had downloaded into the system. And I noticed strikingly that the very earliest temple dedication prayers invoked sacred ancestors and the time of origins. And they would specify each individual angelic prophetic figure that had been relevant to that temple. And over time, it tended to focus in on really ultimately the figure of Moroni, who comes as a statue to adorn the tops of the temples. And I was thinking intellectually about the ways that an Eliadan view might apply to Mormonism. So I'm dealing with life and death and the possibility that we're gone professionally and avocationally, I'm thinking about the very distinctive angelology of early Mormonism. Our angels aren't like regular angels, to wit, they're dead people. And that intellectually, as Kate and I were walking in uh, Camden, Camden, Maine, we were walking in the colonial cemetery and looking at the epigraphs and trying to imagine some of the lives of the people that had been in Camden in the 18th century. And when there was a cluster of dates very close to each other in one family plot, thinking about what kind of epidemic might have caused it or the mother and child, just pulling together these stories. There was a kind of spark uh, in my mind that Kate and that context lit that made me very curious about what is our theology of the dead as Mormons? And so that was the intellectual component. And then there was a very practical component. We had decided that we wanted to raise our children in the mountains. We decided that after all that time in a big coastal city and the big coastal programs, we wanted to be more country folk. And we decided we'd come back to Utah. And in my mind, in retrospect now, I see it as just sheer arrogance. But at the time, I thought... If we move to Utah, am I going to have to become inactive to survive? Because I'd always, I'd, I'd been an atheist until 18, and then I'd moved, I think, within three weeks of becoming a believer, I had left rural Utah and moved to Boston to start at Harvard College. And so my whole, you know, 15 years of my belief as a person committed to God and committed to the life of the mind had all only been available or real in the Boston academic liberal ward environment. Right. And so in my mind, moving to Utah means I'm going to have to become inactive. And I decided... Become well, inactive. Inactive. Yeah, I'd have to become inactive. And I decided, it's so arrogant now in retrospect, but I decided I would write a book on this of Mormon history to keep myself connected to the church, even if I felt like I needed to become inactive. And then we got to Utah and realized that you know, these words were beautiful and filled with soulful and bright and wise and compassionate people. And my thinking I would need to be inactive lasted like 10 days on the ground in Salt Lake City. Uh, let me switch gears a bit. I want to go back to more of your personal history. Um, I like to start with a part of a poem that, that uh, Wordsworth once wrote, which he said, there are in our existence spots of time 
Uh, and then he went on to say that there are these moments that, that shape us, that transform us, that are both a reservoir of, of, of inspiration, but also that explain how we got to be who we are. Can you pick two or three transformative moments in your life where you, you shifted direction or that you can trace to uh, as the origin of the kind of person you are today? That's a good, hard question. Clearly, my turn to theism at age 18 has had a, an outsized influence in my life. And I talk about that in the little yellow book I did for Maxwell Institute, that I went from this. So I, I remember reading Jean-Paul Sartre in the, in the way that a 17-year-old reads any complicated philosophy superficially and bombastically. But I remember I would and take... And sticking out of your backpacks, so everybody sees Well, it. no, exactly, exactly. I would ride the bus. <laughs> I would ride the bus to go to work or whatever in Salt Lake. We were living up in Davis County. And I would just make sure that I would have Jean Paul Sartre or Camus or whoever it was that I was reading, visibly reading, understanding, I don't know, 50% at most of what I thought I was understanding. It, but it was very important to me that I was not some idiot buffoon that was dumb enough to believe in God. So I'd been raised in a Mormon family. I think I had understood myself to be an atheist uh, around the age of eight. Uh, it had uh, not wanted to be baptized and was so angry that uh, my father was forcing me to be baptized that I wept. And my dad said, oh, see, so you're feeling the spirit. And <laughs> it was just, so from age eight to 18, I just was not religious and from age eight to age 17 was probably not even particularly interested in wondering whether i ought to be religious but at age 17 i started to wonder what it what it was what 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 was it that life meant and i think what people forget when they debate around whether they ought to abandon theism entirely is the hard questions don't go away when you abandon theism they just don't. Yeah, cognitive dissonance. It's always on both sides of the faith divide, seems yeah, to me. But, yeah, it, it's part of being human. But when, when you abandon, it, you don't suddenly find the answer to the meaning of life by abandoning this infrastructure of the quest. You can sort of hook onto somebody else's car as it goes by and not inspect it too closely. And then you, you, know, you, go, to your, you go to your little rallies or you feel good about your little cause here and there but but the hard question hasn't been really addressed by that so at age 17 i started to try to figure out what will be the form of my answers to the hard questions and i tried to be open to atheism agnosticism a variety of different religious traditions and over a year of wondering i uh, came to be open to the possibility of god but not in any way convicted of it and then had an experience as I was, it, I, I decided because I thought my mom was a wise and good person, and because we had been so well loved despite my strident, anti-authoritarian, almost anti-social persona by this group of lower middle class Mormons in Kaysville, Utah in the 1980s, I thought, I can give my natal tradition, not necessarily even the benefit of the doubt, but I'll allow them to be a mechanism by which I begin a more formal interrogation of the possibility of God's existence. And so use that mechanism. I thought, okay, so I'll start with the natal tradition. These people have been good to me. My mom is a really wise and bright and good woman. And let me just ponder it through. And it was in that context of allowing this natal tradition to be a mechanism for my interrogation of the possibility of God that I had what was one of the very few transcendent experiences of my life. Transcendent makes, transcendence makes good intuitive sense to me now, but it's not something experientially particularly available to me. Just a few episodes that I think probably are rather like what Wordsworth and other the romantics were trying to describe in their poetry and their philosophy. And that, that left me quite convinced and convicted of the reality of God, this in, encounter with him one 
fall morning in 1990. Let me, let me ask you at this point, <clears throat> because those kinds of what we often call conversion experiences, conversion yeah. episodes, they can have two kinds of value in our life, right? Wordsworth referred to spots of time as having these two functions. That they, he says that they can provide a renovating virtue. In other words, in moments of weakness or apathy, we turn back and we're kind of infused with vigor when we relive okay. that moment. So it can be that kind of anchor, yeah. or it can also represent a kind of portal through which you passed that introduced you to a new way of experiencing reality. I mean, did it do both of those things for you? I no longer have access to the virtue and that old sense of power of that experience. It's not something that I return to and it refills my... A cup. So I think that it, what I don't, I probably don't mention in the book, I can't remember because not every detail is all that relevant in a short trade book. But, you know, I, I, I remained a theist, but became deeply skeptical of Mormonism within nine months of the conversion experience. And it took a couple, three years of sorting and wondering and pondering to figure out where exactly I sat in the broader camp of theism. And in that exploration, I think there was that sense of virtuous power that came from that event. When I struggled very hard to know whether I should leave the MTC or head into the mission field, when a month later I had to struggle to decide, do I resign from the mission and go to the Peace Corps for a year, or do I stay on the mission? As I was agonizing over these hard questions for me, I knew that God lived and knew it. And I knew that he would make sure that I didn't too terribly destroy my life. Because of that experience you because had of before. That experience, because of that experience. But, you know, but, but now it's more that the world looks different. I forget who you'll probably remember. Some philosopher said that it's not so much the looking at an object, but the new vistas that it discloses that describe for you the truth significance of something. And I think much more now, maybe not even necessarily portal, but uh, instrument of seeing. There's, there's some, there are things that I can see that would otherwise be invisible to me if I were not a theist. So I think there's been a transition that it was virtue and power as well as new life. And now very much more, it's about a capacity to see things that would otherwise be invisible to me. Uh, that gives me a nice segue into uh, a question that I have. I've, you also wrote this book, First Principles and Ordinances, which is a, a very beautiful kind of meditation on the first principles and ordinances through the, the lens or the prism of the temple. Yeah. Um, and so I've, so I've picked out a few phrases from your fine book on first principles and ordinances that I wanted to uh, pursue a bit further, prompted by your own account of your pivotal spiritual episode as a young person. You wrote, all of us will at times be tempted to see God as a set of facts or doctrines rather than as a living being. Uh, can, can we can we talk about this idea a little yeah. bit? Because it seems that Mormonism, faith in Mormonism, seems to me to operate in ways that are fairly distinctive. Um, Mormons seldom stand up in testimony meeting and affirm a kind of Alma or Paul-like conversion experience where they found Christ. Yeah, like the Puritans. I mean, the original like Puritan the testimonies, that's what they were for. That's right. And Oliver Cowdery agenda. talked about imitating the Puritan model very specifically. It's clear that that's what he had in mind early on in church right. worship services. They, right. didn't, they didn't really go that route. Yeah. Instead, what we have are a series of ascent, of ascents to intellectual propositions. Although, no, right? it, when people complain about testimonies, they complain about them as travelogues. So they keep trying to corral the parishioners into doing an ascent testimony narrative. But if you listen to people's testimonies when they're not being corralled, they're wide-ranging, sprawling stories that I think ultimately, in a kind of circumlocuting way, are about God's divine presence. But the, there's there, that feedback. Stop telling us stories about your life. Right. Start right. testifying right. to X, Y, or Z, which right. forces back into that 
Okay, set well, that's an interesting mode. point. So the problem is if we do try to comply to it, conform to a template, the template is often just a set of intellectual claims. This happened in 1820. The Book right. of Mormon is historical. These things right. are factually true. Right. Um, which seems to be what you're lamenting here, that, that we mis mistake this set of facts or doctrines for the experience of God himself. Wasn't that it? My memory is Thomas Shepard, the big Puritan yes. minister in Cambridge, then Newtown, has this whole sequence where he says, I get the facts, but they don't transform my heart. And please, God, allow them to transform my heart. Yeah. And I think there's a heuristic convenience to the ascent. It's, it's a way of saying, hey, I'm here, I'm with you, we'll get through this together. That, that's what the ascent does. But then I'm with Thomas Shepard, not on everything, but on that specific thing that, well, yeah, but, so what, well, right? This, this like, is, this carry is what, me into... This is what I want to talk to you about. I wanted to get your opinion, your ideas as to how do we move into that kind of discipleship. Here's the quote from Saint Thomas Shepard, actually. I have it. Strength of reason would commonly convince my understanding that there was a God, but it was utterly insufficient to persuade my will. Yeah, exactly. Except by fits and starts. Exactly. So, so how do we move from the one to the other? Where do you find the, the catalyst? I mean, you. And how is it not a retreat? Because I think for a lot of people, as I've gotten to know people that are more accustomed to that fact ascent model, they've 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 tried to goad me into taking a stand on the traditional catechistic elements of the testimony and are are somehow unwilling to hear of a possibility of another approach that's not that's not negating them but just says let's get to the will let's get to the transformation right. let's get to the experience right. right and i've noticed frequently people will say no i need you to say in un, in no uncertain terms what you think about x y or z yeah. crucial core truth claim Come on, Sam, don't be coy. Say it now, say it publicly, make it happen, or you're full of crap. And, and it's because there's a sense that any, any modulation or movement beyond is, is a confession of defeat, that we decided that we would compete on the secular field of battle. And if you say, I'm not interested in this battle anymore. I don't think it makes of me a more gracious vessel of the love of God. I don't feel that it brings me into greater proximity to God. I'm not that interested. It's sort of like the person who like tries just a little bit at an athletic game, obviously is losing and says, well, I... <laughs> I'm not into this anyway. Right? Let's pull it to another point. So I think part of it is figuring out how to say, how, how to make this not be a retreat. I, well, I know I'm, I may be prone myself to a different kind of temptation, and that is that I, I find the doctrines, I find the theology so powerful and intellectually compelling. Um, I mean, to me, it's astound, astounding that it took 1,800 years for a Christian thinker like Joseph Smith to arise and say, you know, there's got to be a way to save the entire human family. Right, right. Here's, to get universalism to actually work in yeah. a meaningful, robust, and sacramental way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or, or to say, no, you know, I really don't think that infants are going to be damned forever. Um, there's, you know, accountability. There, these principles of agency matter. Um, God isn't a sovereign de deity that engineered the Holocaust, and God isn't um a, a this inflexible impassable unfeeling god is which is how the creeds define him right so just as a matter of comparative theology right i i agree with sterling mcmurn right who after he wrote his book on mormon theology supposedly his colleague accosted him in the hallway and said sterling you've made mormonism sound so, so much more intellectually respectable than it is and he said well that's true but that's because mormons think it's so much less intellectually respectable yeah, 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 yeah. Than, than it is um, so I've been accused at times of basing my testimony on, on, on a kind of aesthetic principle uh, rather than some personal conversion experience. I don't think that's wrong. Um, 
Well, I think it's a good but, starting point. Yeah, I, I think where I think it ultimately would probably be non-productive is if it merged quietly with the capital R romantic appreciation of art as an end in itself rather than as yeah. some connection to yeah. divinity. Yeah. That's why in in more recent work, playing theologian, I, it, I think the pieces uh, in press at Dialogue for sometime this year and then working it through, I'm trying to triangulate whether Joseph Smith's Light of Christ theology allowed him to have uh, an overarching divinity that mattered while also having this more rigorous and robust and tangible experience of God and community that allows him to get some of the aesthetic beauty that you've described, but also an aesthetic religious beauty that's grounded in God. Yeah. Because ultimately, the love of aesthetic purity is a beautiful thing. That's great. I don't have any particular objection to it. But, but I worry if it's wholly circumscribed by the imminent frame, if it really is just the appreciation of symmetry, is it godly? Right. It, and that, not, not godly in the sense of, oh, that's a better person. And I'm not trying to get into these arguments about who's better than whom. But, but is it, it, does it connect us to God and divinity? And that, to me, is the important question. I think, I think it can. I think also that, that a greater appreciation for the divine nature of beauty and the aesthetic would, yeah. would go a long ways towards enriching our lives in very, in very practical ways. I'm thinking of Marilyn Robinson and her book, Gilead, right? The, the preacher says at one point, I'm not so sure God will judge us in strict moral standards. I think he may judge us on the basis of how beautifully we lived our lives. <laughs> and I think that's a wonderful that's sentiment. That's gorgeous Calvinism. And, and, and I think what it suggests is that too often we think there's always a right and a wrong, whereas often I think, no, there's, there's, a, there's a beautiful and a less beautiful way to live a life. And even I think there's some room for the possibility that beauty is in part about harmony. So not every beautiful object or not every beautiful life will be identically beautiful. And I think you could even argue that a museum full of identical reproductions of the Mona Lisa is not even worth going to. Right. It's like a smirking performance art kind of a thing. And I think we've had a tendency to believe that if you believe in God, if you're religious, then what you really want is this caricature of the Puritans that we all have, that they were all identically afraid of pleasure, all identically afraid of anything that even remotely differed from them, absolutely afraid of their sex organs. You know, all these caricatures that we have of Puritans, we assume that if you're godly, and even if you're talking about beauty as a connection to the godly, that what we mean is everything looks exactly the same. Which is bullshit. Right. It's just it's it's not even true of the Puritans, let alone yeah. true of yeah. what ought to be true of us. And I think maybe having that that accessibility that if what we're after is being vessels of God's grace and of both experiencing and crafting and responding to who and being shaped by beautiful things is not some capital R romantic cop out. It's the work of salvation. Right. And it will have this incredible harmony of different kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. Another point you make in your book is you refer to faith as being a principle of action. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about, about action in Mormon culture. You know, our vocabulary at times betrays us, right? We do home teaching. We don't minister. We do home teaching. Right. Uh, we say our we don't pray. We say our prayers, um, <laughs> and we do temple work. We don't go to the temple and worship. Yeah. We do temple work, and we're not devout Mormons. We're active Mormons, right, right? Right. I mean, there's this kind of obsessive preoccupation with activity, work, engagement, and that's all well and good, right? Because uh, was it Wilfred Woodruff who said we can't no Brigham Young we can't get to Zion by sitting on a hemlock log and singing everlasting songs of bliss, right? That's not, that's that's not uh, holiness. But at the same time, um, do you ever, do you sometimes feel the, the absence of a, of a more meditative devotional tradition in Mormonism? 
Where is it? Where might we find it? I'm deeply sympathetic to this. And I think that we have sometimes worked as if Max Weber was right, that we're just alone and haunted and rushing furiously to prove that we're actually uh, loved of God. I don't know that he's necessarily correct, but he's been helpful, I guess, for a lot of us thinking about it. But that notion that the work ethic is driven out of a fear of not mattering. And I think those of us that are a bit workaholic probably are driven by a similar, it's not just religious people, right? We, yeah. we write more manuscripts, we write more grants, we do more studies, we write more books, not just because we love the experience of it. It's also because we're a little haunted. Cutting a bit close to home here. Yeah. Sam. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's, we are a little bit, yeah. if we weren't haunted, we would probably wander about barefoot in the mountains with our beloveds a lot more than we do. <laughs> so I don't think it's clear that Mormonism is uniquely haunted. I don't think it's necessarily bad that we're as good at working as we are because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There are a lot of people that need to be fed. There are a lot of people that need to be clothed. There are a lot of people that need to be listened to and cared for and touched. So there's an element of it that I think is very good. And I think that um, sometimes when you spend too much time in your own head, you get quite muddled. Yeah. Uh, and not, I'm not saying that you should be afraid of thought. I'm saying that good thought, embodied thought, doesn't really happen in a Cartesian thought experiment. Some stuff does, some components of it, fair enough, but not all of it. And my worry is that counterposing a, that the risk of describing a more philosophical, meditative, contemplative Mormon as, a, as an important corrective is the risk that some people may interpret that as a call to more Cartesianism, which I don't think. Explain what you mean by that. Oh, I, and I confess that I'm uh, indebted uh, heavily to Charles Taylor's characterization of it. But this notion that um, the only true thoughts thought are those that are disembodied and stripped of emotion, and not just the emotion of anger or fear, but the broad array of emotions. So that the Cartesian project as it comes to unfold is the stripping away, a deep reductionism, not just methodological reductionism, where you try to take a complex biological phenomenon, reduce it into simpler parts, and then do hypothesis-driven experiments along a particular sliver of the overall problem, but reductionism in the sense of what it's possible to imagine thinking being is thinking only what's done in an utterly disembodied, utterly apathetic way, apathetic in the sense separated from the emotions. And, and I think Taylor makes a pretty persuasive argument that that's, that's crap. That's not actually true. There's a role for it. There's absolutely a role for it. But it's, it, it ought not to be understood as anything more than a heuristic for some certain kinds of problems. So the one fear I have if we argue too strongly that we're not intellectually rigorous enough or we're not philosophical enough is that we can end up with this sort of Cartesian folly. Now, in terms of meditation contemplation that is gently mystical, and I'm not talking about like where you put your crystals or what kind of incense you burn at your essential oils or whatever. I'm talking about this possibility that certain modes of conscious experience can be closer to more proximate to god than others prayer uh, fasting um, aesthetic experiences prayer and fasting in the woods or prayer and fasting in the setting of beautiful music i think there is a role for those and i think we could stand to have a little bit more of that but there is always the risk that you end up then just wandering off in your yoga pants, never to be heard from again. Well, that's you, true. Serving the squirrels in the forest. Yeah, quite but, but true not, you know, not, not actually helping people. Yeah. And the one place that I've seen us do it, and I don't know whether it's still true or whether it was even true when I observed it, was historically, at least in my experience, 
the celestial room of the temple, you were told you've done your temp your temple work, <laughs> you know, you've done your endowment, but then you get to the celestial room, and in the celestial room, you're supposed to leave yourself open to revelation. And I remember as a young believer, 18, 19, first going through the temple, that I loved, uh, I at first did not love the liturgy of the temple. I didn't love the rituals uh, at first. I've come to really love them quite a bit. But at first I found them very disorienting and strange. But what I did love was the celestial room. I loved the sense that you've been welcomed into the presence of God and you are there to bask in his glory. Yeah. And I've noticed that a reasonable number of Latter-day Saints do pause in the celestial room. And I wonder whether that could be a kind of a model for a that's, more that's, 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 meditative Mormonism. That's lovely. And I think that that, I, I hope that that is a representation of what I have found as my own kind of reconciliation of this tension. Because, you know, we tend to dichotomize, you know, you're the, you have the Mary or you have the Martha tradition, you have the contemplative or you have the active. Right. And, and, and I think a real insight that was helpful to me was reading Proverbs, um, 16th chapter. So commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. Mm. So there's the sense that the one should blend into the yeah, other, yeah, yeah. that it's right action becomes holiness. That's a very cognitive science kind of and, spin, uh, isn't it? And uh, so Nothing in the temple, you the go sun. through all of the steps and processes and procedures and you obey all the laws. And then you enter into that, that moment of contemplation and reverential appreciation. And it's a direct the indictment of this Cartesianism. Yeah. It's a notion that thinking involves bodies. Yeah. Thinking involves patterns of experience and behaviors. Yeah. And I, I've, I've wondered, again, this just following Charles Taylor, I confess, but I've wondered whether more of a call to embodied thought and embodied worship is a useful model for it. Because... Uh, I think they both. Well, this is one thing I love about the Mormon conception of God that we see in the Book of Moses. That you know, Mormons don't use the word omniscience very much, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'm glad we don't because it seems to suggest a, an unembodied, non-perspectival, right, simultaneous right. apprehension of reality. And what we get in in Enoch's ascension narrative is this glimpse of God who was deeply imbricated in human relationships. And whose knowledge emanates from that immersion in a real embodied relational kind of existence. And I think that's a lovely way of thinking about the, the meaninglessness of a kind of non-perspectival or disembodied Interesting. knowledge or thought. Our cousins with the creeds use incarnation with a capital I as a way to start to think about some of that. And I've found... Eastern Orthodox, particularly, but not exclusively, also some Catholic writing about incarnation has been helpful to feel like there is a kinship, a theological kinship with them around this particular notion that right. that there you gotta you gotta have both, right. and and without both you have nothing, which I think is something that's very tricky and heretical that Joseph Smith does without both. Both, both, uh, both transcendent and imminent, right. both uh, disembodied, impersonal, and personal. That if there's not some sense of both, you ultimately have neither. And that incarnation is this deep argument for interdependence of our earthly experience, our fleshly experience, and the divine and spiritual experience. You can't have one without yeah. the other. Because I think if it's just... If it's all just embodied, then then I think you get a strict materialism, which I think is incoherent as a theological system. But if you do not have the marriage of uh, some transcendence and some, even if it's majority, embedded and embodied uh, experience or, or substance, that, then I don't think you have... Uh, maybe maybe Joseph Smith's story about the spirit and the body or the soul of man, that you know, the spirit can't exist without the body and the body that's can't first. exist without the spirit. That yeah. maybe that's a story about this broader sense that you, you gotta have both. Well, well let's move from the abstract to the particular and the personal. If you don't mind sharing, are there any particular devotional practices that you have found that lift you out of the realm of just 
intellectual engagement with the wonderful doctrines and theology of Mormonism. Uh, another way, let me frame that another way. You can answer either one. And that is, what should the relationship be between history and faith? Um, because it seems to me that much of, of uh, the millennial kind of intellectual universe today uh, represents a confusion of the two. To be a Mormon means to be immersed in a certain history and to assent to a certain kind of history and a certain mm -hmm. narrative. And that becomes identified with their faith. Mm -hmm. And if the one begins to collapse, then the other collapse in its totality. Mm -hmm. um, how do you migrate between the two? So the, I'll answer the first question because I think that's easier for me to answer. Um, I would say that there are three things that I currently do that are devotionally very important to me. One is scripture study and prayer with my wife and children. We never used to do that. Uh, we always meant to, but never got around to it. And my wife, God bless her, put a, an alarm on her iPhone. Every night at 8.45 p.m., the alarm goes off. So you've actually gotten Lehi out of the wilderness? <laughs> We're doing a little bit more episodic reading <laughs> rather than trudging through okay. sequentially. But but we gather together, these people I love and who love me, and we do two verses each. It's relatively quick. We chat just a little bit and we pray. And that sense, it's a sense again of incarnation that it's not just these vast abstract notions, these scriptural texts, it's also these people that I love. and hearing the scriptures read aloud by a beloved child is really quite moving to me to th their voices and their minds and their immersion and these sacred texts i just i love it that means a great deal to me the second two i think will strike people as a little bit less traditional but i may as well just tell the truth one is opera i i love opera when my life changed substantially about five or six years ago with an illness in the family. And I had a real moral crisis wondering what exactly am I doing with my life? How am I living? I wasn't doing anything debauched. I was just a busy workaholic academic physician, but I was missing out on transcendence and the earthy substance of being a devoted husband and father. And in that transformation, I learned about the Metropolitan Opera's high def broadcasts, Met HD, that they do to the local popcorn movie theater that normally shows zombie, disemboweled zombies do opera. And for me, opera is the total art form and it is gorgeous and glorious. And sometimes I'll even have one, uh, one little headphone in listening to opera as I go about my work day. It just fills me with this sense of beauty and divine power and longing and love in a way you know i was talking to a, a, a spiritual and wise and intelligent protestant and she thought i was trying to invoke that capital r romantic thing uh you know the, the appreciation of great art is good for you but but for me this is one of the vessels by which god communicates to me is is opera and the third thing, the third devotional practice is what I call cookies of the priesthood. Uh, it's a riff on keys of the priesthood. Somebody got it in his mind that I needed to be the, in the elders quorum presidency for my ward. I thought, what on earth do I have to offer? <laughs> so, it, it harried, confused intellectual. I thought, well, my wife taught me to cook five years ago. There's no reason she couldn't teach me to bake. And people like cookies. So she taught me to bake cookies and I probably bake, I bake 200 to 300 cookies a month and I take them to church and I give them to people. And, and I found that sense of earth and hearth is really important. I find that that sense of gently troubling Victorian gender norms is probably healthy at a time when people are feeling so fractured and sclerosed on both sides of it. And I think the sense of awareness of the pleasure of the common meal, you know, it's sort of my, you know, these agapes, the love feasts that used to be yeah. conducted. I, I wondered about that because I've been so moved by the ancient Christian agapes and frankly of the early modern agapes. And to be honest with you, these cookies of the priesthood are 
in part my contribution to the agape. The, Chris Wright, she's a grad student at Princeton right now in religion, just a phenomenal thinker about material culture and Mormonism. She wrote a book, a, a chapter in an edited volume that Kate, my wife, and Matt Bowman edited that was called We Baked a Lot of Bread. And it was about women baking the bread for Eucharist, for the sacrament, and about them sewing the lace covers for the altars, and about them sewing the temple garments. And it was this, it's such a gorgeous essay, this meditation on ephemerality and incarnation, that these, these are evanescent, but their encounters with divinity and they matter. And so it was the sort of, what can I do? Well, I'm not that useful. I mostly just say things that make sense to no one, right? That's, that's what I'm us. good at. Yeah, that's what I'm good at. That's not particularly helpful in an elder scorn presidency, but cookies might be. And that yeah. with Chris Wright. So I would say Beautiful. family scripture study, opera, and cookies. What about you? What are your... Um, devotional practices. Well, I uh, I remember one time I was here on campus at a uh, sacred space conference, and we had a break in the proceedings. There were two Jewish scholars, an Islamic scholar, and a few Protestants, and myself. And during the break, I was walking across campus, and I saw the one member who was a an Orthodox Jewish scholar, and I approached him because I wanted to engage him in conversation, and I noticed that he was in the midst of prayers. And this was like at two o'clock in the afternoon. Huh. And so I, I, I backed away, but I, I remember being struck by the, the intensity uh, and what seemed to me the, the beauty of, of his devotional moment. It was kind of a remote area of campus. Not many people were likely to encounter him there. Um, and, I, and I thought, you know, I wanted I wanted to replicate something like that hmm. in my own life. So I have found that every morning, if I try to find time for a psalm and uh, a sacred hymn, and then a reading, and will you sing it, or do you read mm, the psalm? Sing I, it? Do you I, use like Isaac no, the Watts, I, the old Watts? No, I don't. I, I read the psalm, but I okay. but I have a, a hymn. Uh, okay, and then I have a devotional reading that comes from a list of. My huh. preferred kind of devotional authors, like whose Thomas. Psalter do you use? I don't use the Psalter. I just use the the Book of Psalms. Good old fashioned King James. Yeah, interesting. Let me end with three questions. Um, first, what do you think? What do you think Mormons do really well, or Mormonism does really well? I th I think we uh, pull off the the that having a coherent community. I think we do that very well. Sometimes it feels stifling we do it so well. But if you get sick, food appears. If you uh, are in trouble, help comes. And when you're well, you are the food and the help. And even though it's hard for me, I'm a little bit of a, I'm actually a, Kate thinks I'm full of crap, but I do think I'm a little introverted. I do like to have time alone and not be so much in the thick of, of socializing. And even for me, I appreciate and understand the importance that it That's kind of a historic has. attribute that we and others have associated with Mormonism. It seems to be uh, increasingly called into question as we hear increasing voices of those who feel that they're not made to feel a part of that yeah. community, single women, single mothers, gays, others. Yeah. You think yeah, we, we have the resources always... to, to overcome those challenges? I think it depends on the terms of engagement because there is a component of our simple failings that I think we can fix. We can be better. We can have more important and visible roles better tailored to their specific walks in life for gay members, for single women. We can do a heck of a lot better about how we talk together and work together as men and women. I think that there is so much 
beauty in our history and in our future. And I think there's a reasonable amount of Victorian ideology that really is not particularly relevant to the fundamentals of gospel and church. So I think we've got work to do there. And I think that those criticisms ought to make us thoughtful and even ought to make us remorseful. I think we all do need to repent. And I think those calls are helpful for that. The complexity comes in the terms of engagement. I don't think that it's true that the only way we can love is in a post Foucauldian identity politics world. And there are some, I don't think the individuals are trying to make this argument. I think it's more something that emerges on the rhetoric. So explain that in simpler language. The, the post Foucauldian. Oh, uh, the. I think there's a sense in which in our contemporary hyper-individualized anti-community world, there has been a move from kin identity. This is again, Charles Taylor, from kin identity to categorial identity. Kin identity has a flexibility. Within a kindred, you will be many different things to many different people. You'll be a sibling, a parent, a cousin, a nephew, et cetera. And because those identities are inherently flexible, communities that are based in that kin identity have, I think, a capacity to tolerate difference that the current stereotype suggests is absent, but that stereotype is quite misleading. And there's been a move through the politics of recognition, identity politics, Foucauldian identity, and the, the sort of fetishization of victimization and subalternity that requires the creation of a victimizer every time a victim is created that has evolved into what he calls a categorical identity. And the categorical identity says, I'm not embedded in a kin network. I am this. I am a, and then you insert the demographic variable that has been decreed by contemporary society to be the determinative variable that defines you. And then you say, your interactions with me must conform to this categorical identity of mine. And that locks people in. People think that it creates this great flexibility, but it locks people in. And I watch, I watch these, uh, these, nascent communities around particular identities and watch them fracture very quickly because all that unites is this one strict definition of what it means to be a gay man or what it means to be a lesbian or what it means to be an intellectual or what it means to be uh, an agnostic or whatever precise category we are using to describe the other that capital O other, the subaltern using this Foucauldian idea of the, of the oppressed individual, this whole notion that every encounter we have is itself an expression of a power structure that needs to be deconstructed as a victimizer, victimized. And this is encounter. what you're saying we need to resist. That's what we need to resist. Because uh, if what we're saying is for the church to actually be a meaningful community, we have to agree with a very particular view of what it means to be a gay man or what it means to be a lesbian or what it means to be transgender for some of the biggest, most dramatic and painful areas of argument. I don't think we're going to get very far. It's going to be hard. There's been a huge change in what it means to have a sexual identity and, and what sexual identity means even having one. That things are very different than they were 50 years ago. Right. We're going to have to find a way that emphasizes community and embodiment and kin rather than categorical identity in a way. I like that. Forward. Kin rather than category. But I, I think it's hard. I think we need to be patient with each other and we need to acknowledge that some really good people are homophobic and some really good people are gay. Yeah. And we've got to find a way to see the goodness in these people 
as we find our way through what matters most, right. our becoming vessels for the love of God to each other. Terrific. Thank you. Our guest today has been Sam Brown, uh, an accomplished intellectual historian who wrote a terrific book on In Heaven As It Is On Earth, and who also is the author of First Principles and Ordinances. Uh, Sam, I greatly admire and appreciate your contributions intellectually as, as well as spiritually to the kingdom. Thank you for being my Likewise, guest. Likewise, Terrell. Thanks. Thank you.